Hey everyone, my name is Paul. This is Trek Jitsu. Thanks a lot for tuning in today to the show. We got a great episode for you. Trek Jitsu is brought to you by Matrix. Matrix is a jujitsu video streaming service. What we're trying to do over at Matrix is provide you with constant videos of sparring, technique videos, um, tournament footage, highlight videos, and all sorts of cool stuff. So if you want to check that out, go check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash C slash Matrix Show Your Role. The links will be posted in our show notes and everywhere where Trek Jitsu is posted. So please go check it out. We're also looking for viewer submitted footage. So if you like what we're doing and you want to showcase some of your skills, please send in a video to matrixvideo at gmail.com. Again, all the links will be at the Trek Jitsu website and the show notes. My guest today is Clay Mayfield. Clay is a Hoist Gracie brown belt who is an instructor at IQ Jiu Jitsu in Illinois. Uh, Clay is also a black belt in judo, and he was the purple belt gi Gracie world champion. He also won purple belt gi and no gi Gracie national champions. Clay just got done traveling around Europe for a couple of weeks where he was teaching some seminars and hanging out with lots of people who he knows over here. And I found out about that. And that's exactly the type of stuff that I'm interested in talking to people about. So I had him on the show and we had a really great time talking about Gracie Jiu Jitsu, self-defense training, the Jiu Jitsu lifestyle and all sorts of stuff. So I really hope you guys enjoy the show. Check out our show notes at trekjitsu.com. And please enjoy my conversation with Clay Mayfield. What's up, Clay? Thanks, thanks a lot for doing the show. I really appreciate you coming on, talking about some jujitsu. Um, so I first kind of got introduced to you via our mutual friend Sammy, because you were teaching a seminar in Germany. What were you doing over here in Europe? Can you talk about that for a little bit? Sure. So, Paul, thanks for having me on the interview. Firstly, I appreciate the uh, the exposure and the chance to have a conversation with yeah, you. Yeah, man. I was in Germany traveling and uh, had the chance to set up a few seminars, actually in Europe to be more specific or less specific as the case may be. <laughs> I, I've been to Europe several times. I used to live in England and I came over to, to Germany a couple of years ago to compete in Regensburg at, the, at a Purple Belt Invitational. And so I made some contacts in the Jiu Jitsu community and ended up coming over in September for 27 days just traveling through Europe and had the chance to set up a couple of seminars. So I taught two seminars in Germany and did some, some extra training as well. I had some of my contacts, some of the schools of the people that I know in Germany and also taught at the uh, at the army base in, in Kaiserslautern and then taught another seminar in Belgium, traveled through Austria and France and then taught two more seminars in England. That's awesome, man. What's uh, what's it like traveling to all these new places, teaching seminars, and what do you think of like the level of jujitsu over here? It's it's great. Uh, jujitsu doesn't seem like it's quite as big in Europe yet as it is in the states or in, in South America or North America. But the the level of the schools that I went to was was on point. Which schools did you go to exactly? Let's see can jog my memory <laughs> first i i trained i flew into frankfurt germany and i trained with my buddy alexander neufong oh i know alex I know. oh you do yeah alex is the man he uh trains with us at matrix all the time and uh i was just there a few i, I was talking to him a few weekends ago when he competed at the matrix open okay yeah he's the man yeah alex is very flexible he's <laughs> Uh, very talented. He's one of the guys that I competed against back in 2014. Oh, wow. And so uh, I went and trained with him and uh, with one of his friends, uh, Abel Sico. 
and they're both brown belts. We got some rolls actually as soon as I got off the plane. I headed over there to school and, and uh, tried to roll through the jet lag or roll, roll off the jet lag. <laughs> and uh, so that was the first school. And then I think second was was training on the army base. I went with uh, with my buddy Drew Trevilian, who I was staying with at, in Kaiser Schlatter, and we went on to the. Uh, the army base i hope i'm not saying that wrong is it an air force base yeah it's an air force base technically but they have many bases here in kaiser slaughter and like there's uh army bases there's like seven army bases several air force bases you know i think the one that you were at was an air force base but they're all it's all the same okay so i went on to the military base and Mm -hmm. got to get to roll with some of those guys at the kaiser slaughter military gracie jiu-jitsu training group and that's where I met Sammy Simfukwe and some of the other guys. Had a great time training in that class, so that would have been the second school. And then I headed up to Osnabrück, Germany, and I got to train with uh, Valentino, Valentino Pantera at his school, Pantera's MMA, I think. And that was where I taught the first seminar. It was a, a no-gi takedowns and, and leg locks seminar. Oh, cool. That's awesome. And for uh, from there, actually, unbeknownst to me, Dean Lister was also teaching a seminar a couple of hours away. Um, uh, and a, a lot of what I learned in the leg locks I'd gotten from Dean's DVDs. Uh, so it was, uh, it was kind of kind of cool to hear that he was in Germany at the same time. I've heard Dean is, uh, speaks several languages, and he's, he's a very smart guy. Yeah, he's the man. He's, he's great at leg locks. Yeah, he did a seminar at uh, at Matrix, and he did we did a podcast afterwards, and that was that was a lot of fun. Um, oh, really? Yeah, he's the man. He's a really cool guy. And, um, yeah, he's great. It might have been – the seminar that you're thinking of might have been the one at our academy, actually. I think it might have been. Was Sammy there? No, I don't think so. – I think he – I don't think so. Maybe it was a different one then. Okay. So I know Dean did well, several. Okay, right on. Yeah. Well, just uh, just by the way, I would I highly recommend his catch system of, of DVDs of leg locks. Mm-hmm. Um, I've learned quite a bit from those. So that was the second. Uh, the, the third school was the uh, Valentino Pantera School up in Osnabrück, Germany, and that's way up by by Oldenburg and by the North Sea. And then after that, my friend Andre Gunnel picked me up, and we drove to his school in Munster, Germany. And Munster is a really cool city. It's like a a bustling college town. I forget how many students are are, are there, but it's it's just a ridiculous amount of of college students that live in that city. And there are like 11 renowned universities or something like that Mm -hmm. in that one area. And so the city's got this really young, upbeat healthy vibe to it it was one of my favorite places i got to visit in europe this time and he and his guys run a a gracie training group uh within a like a taekwondo school or a karate school oh that's really cool i think it's a it's a separate entity but they they share the mat space and so we taught a a three-hour back mount seminar there we got in depth with some back mount control and attacks and then after that I headed back to Frankfurt and I picked up a rental car and I drove to Belgium and I trained with my buddy, uh, Florin Menge. And I know I'm saying that wrong, <laughs> but, uh, uh, Florin was another one of the purple belts that, that I fought in, in Germany in 2014. So I ended up visiting several of the guys that I competed against. Oh, that's awesome. You know, it's, it's kind of funny when you compete, it's such a great way to make friends. Mm-hmm. It's so true. <laughs> and, uh, so, I got to visit his school, and he's he's now a brown belt, and he has the a Gracie Baja in in Liège, Belgium, and it's actually a, a really big school, a really nice facility. And so I taught a uh, just a self defense seminar there. We went over some headlock defenses and wall choke defenses and that kind of thing. I got to train with those guys a little bit afterwards, and then drove back from uh, from Belgium back into the Kaiserslautern Slaughter area, stay with Drew Trevilian for another couple of days. And then after that, I headed across Germany to the, the Munster area, and uh, about 70 miles north of Munster or München, there's there's a little town called Regensburg, and it's maybe 70,000 people. It's a small town as well, um, but that's actually the town where I went and competed in 2014 at that Purple Belt Invitational, and uh, Jan 
uh, Jan Zander is his name, and he's a purple belt. And then his girlfriend, uh, Hannah Katarina, is also a purple belt. And they're just exceptional people and exceptional purple belts. Mm. And they've got a, a great facility called uh, Fitness Fight Fusion or Fight Fusion Regensburg. I'm sorry, Fight Fusion Re- Regensburg. And it's, uh, to my understanding, it's one of the biggest schools in Germany. They've got a great student base in jiu-jitsu and in kickboxing. And so I, I got to train with them for a couple of days and really enjoyed that. And then after that, I just drove down into Austria and stayed near Innsbruck for for a few days, just kind of a little personal vacation within the trip. And uh, I'll, Austria is one of my favorite places to be. I love just going up into the Alps and being alone. It's so beautiful so, there. It is. Have you been Have you been down to that area? A little bit. I have not stayed in Austria, but we've driven through a couple of times. Like uh, most recently, we went down to Croatia for eight days of fun in the sun, and uh, we drove through Austria. So I saw the Alps, you know, we drove through them, but I have not stayed. I need to get down there and like do an actual like stay in a little uh, cabin or something like that. I saw some of your pictures on Facebook and it looked absolutely incredible. So it's just breathtaking, man. I mean, you've seen it driving through. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. But Awesome. One of my favorite places to stay is the Innsbruck area. Hmm. Innsbruck is just two hours south of München, and it's uh, it's right across the border. But it's it's in a really nice alpine play, or, or area. It's really beautiful there. So I just got away and uh, stayed at a bed and breakfast for five days down there. Kind of hiked up in the mountains every day. It was really pretty. That sounds awesome. Did, did a lot of reading and hammocking and just kind of uh, personal retreat. And then after that, I, I drove back to, to Frankfurt and uh, returned the car and took a, a train from Frankfurt to Paris. Uh, I stayed the night in Paris. I didn't get to explore France very much, but I, I just stayed the night between trains. And then in the morning, I took the train under the channel to London. Oh, that's so cool. And um, that, that was that was pretty cool. Like in and of itself, I'd never been under the under the ch- uh, the under the channel before yeah um, that's awesome I can't, I can't talk this morning <laughs> but uh, um, I used to live in in England when I was seven years old my dad was doing a medical practice in the London area oh so that's awesome live there. that's really cool uh, but but it was 16 years ago and I don't mm. I didn't remember a lot of it so it was nice to retrace those steps and London is a really cool uh, really cool city it's it's old. It's got a lot of history. It's also got a, a good vibe to it, though. There's, there's just so much to see and do there. So, I chilled out in the the London area and got to visit the Imperial War Museum again and the uh, the British Museum, see the Rosetta Stone and the um, Egyptian ruins and just all the amazing artifacts there. I'm kind of a little bit of a history geek, so <laughs> me history. too. That was that was a lot of fun. And then after that. Uh, after a couple of days in London, uh, my buddy Chris Ellis picked me up, and he is a, a Hoist Gracie Blue Belt, and he runs a, a Hoist Network in Redo, which is a couple of hours south of London, or maybe an hour south. And so we taught a seminar there, uh, guard passing with strikes, and really enjoyed training at his school for a couple of days, and then took the train up to Manchester, which is about halfway halfway up the English Peninsula. I love Manchester. And, I've been to Manchester. Well, I haven't been to London yet, but Manchester is very nice. It is, and uh, I've, everywhere I've been on the trip was nice, man. It was a great experience. Yeah, but uh, Manchester was was good. We got to train with Rob Dixon at his certified training center under the Gracie Academy. Got some great roles with his guys and good seminar. We worked on some throws and guard passing there as well. And then after that, it was a, a long trip home. From Manchester to Copenhagen to Frankfurt to Detroit to St. Louis, and then a three-hour drive. But uh, it's a lot, yeah. It's a lot. Yeah, it was. <laughs> um, you know how adventurous the trip can be. Yeah, I do. It can get pretty uh, crazy pretty quick on all those long car rides and planes and everything. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, no doubt. What did you but, think uh, of uh, What did you think of the skill level in London? Was it really good, or what did you think? Oh, I also uh, I also got to visit Hodger Gracie's headquarters. Oh, that's awesome. I've heard they're incredible. They are very talented. So 
all inclusive of that, I mean, the uh, I really didn't see a, a difference in the level of talent in in Europe and in America. Even though jiu jitsu, judo, of course, is hugely popular in Europe, but mm-hmm. even though the the Brazilian jiu jitsu community and the Gracie jiu jitsu community is a little newer in Europe than it is in America, I didn't feel I didn't feel that in the talent level at all. Everyone was everyone was tough and everyone trained hard, and it was a uh, uh, just the jiu jitsu community. Um. What do you think is the big difference between like the way the Gracie schools that you visited train versus, say, Hodger Gracie's Academy? Well, you know, I've I've come up under Hoist Gracie, and I've also trained extensively with your Iron Hunter and Hoyler, and and you know, I go out to Gracie Academy every chance I get and train out there, and uh, train with a lot of the Gracie Humaida and sometimes the Gracie Baja. So I've got I've got a lot of cross training or a lot of training, you know, with the Gracie family, Rodrigo Gracie, and and also I try to cross-train with as many other schools as I can. I'm a big believer in just the the cooperative jiu-jitsu community. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. So with that, uh, you know, with that exposure to the different flavors of, of jiu-jitsu, I would say the, the Gracie Academy schools and the Hoy schools, you know, they tend to focus more on, on the self-defense approach to jiu-jitsu. And you know, protecting its strikes and, and keeping the, the punches in mind when you train, when you roll, and just training the the seven five three code. So you're training all the areas of jujitsu: the uh, the standing self defense, the striking, the clinch work and throws, the groundwork, and the philosophy. And um, the you know other schools that I've been to put emphasis on different things. You know, some on on competition, some on MMA, and so everyone has their, you know, their particular focus. Can you explain what the seven five three system is? Sure. So, the the seven five three code is a code of moral conduct that Alio Gracie and the Valente brothers uh, teach in accompaniment with the physical techniques of jujitsu, because the goal isn't just to create good fighters. The goal is to create good human beings, and so. Seven stands for the seven virtues of a true warrior, as Elio defined them, and these are rectitude, courage, benevolence, politeness, honor, honesty, and loyalty. And Elio had a description for what each of those meant to a jiu-jitsu student. The five stands for the five areas of a balanced physical lifestyle, and these are attitude, rest, nutrition, hygiene, and exercise. And the three stands for three key mindsets. And these are Zenshin, Mushin, and Fudoshin. Zenshin means a state of expanded awareness, so paying attention to things that are happening around you. And that could be when you walk into a room, you notice where the exits are, or it could be, you know, when you're rolling, you're you're mindful of the footlock that's coming up if you leave your legs dangling out. So, uh, you know, the the idea, of course, just like anything we do in Jiu-Jitsu is to to apply it first on the mat and then see where the the broader application in life is. Um, So Zanshin would be expanded awareness. Mushin, the the second mindset, means no mind. So that represents your ability to direct your attention inward or to focus your attention on one thing and not be pulled aside by distractions. And the last uh, last mindset is Fudoshin. And Fudoshin means a state of emotional equanimity. So you're you're not riding the roller coaster of emotions. If if I get tapped, I don't throw my belt down and quit jujitsu. And if I tap someone, I don't jump up and dance around the mat. And you just hold a state of emotional equanimity. So that that's the seven five three code: seven virtues of a true warrior, five areas of, of a balanced physical lifestyle, and uh, the three key mindsets. That's pretty uh, comprehensive. I haven't. I haven't really learned too much about that. I've heard about it before, but I haven't like I haven't heard it explained that well. So thank you. Um, do you try to implement that into your own life? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the again, you know, like we were talking about earlier with the seven five three code, the the goal for me, you know, I, I'm a competitor. I love competing. I love uh, the self defense. I love every part of the art, but. I'm not getting in fights every day, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not even competing every day. So, 
the the real mission is to take what I'm teaching and training on the mats and be able to apply that every day. And so I, I like to, you know, I try to live jujitsu. There's an old samurai maxim that says, "He who uh, he who has mastered an art reveals it in his every action." Hmm. And so I try to take jujitsu and see how what we do on the mat applies in real life. What uh, what have you found? What have you found so far? Because I think about this stuff all the time too. But I want to hear like what what have you uh, experienced so far? That's a broad question. I know. <laughs> um, let's take something specific. So one of the biggest lessons for me to learn in, ju- in jujitsu that that the physical practice on the mat taught me in my everyday life was that. Uh, just that every, everyone's different or there are different ways to look at the same thing. Right. And I was I was homeschooled, so... <laughs> me too. Old. Were you really? Yeah, me too, K through 12. <laughs> yeah, I never set foot in a public school until I was in Germany when I was 16. Um, and I went with some of my friends, but I was homeschooled my entire life. And so, uh, so you understand, you know... Oh, I understand I more than anyone. Right? <laughs> We didn't always get the same social exposure or, or the same open-mindedness that other people got going to public schools. Everyone listening to this podcast is like, that's why he's so weird, homeschool kid. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, my, you know, my buddies joke about me when I first started jiu-jitsu. I was 15, and I was just kind of like stood at attention with my combat boots on, you know, uh, uh, called everyone, you know, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, and uh, just – didn't really know how to interact with people and there's there's nothing wrong with respect and there's nothing wrong with homeschooling I, I, there were a lot of great things about it but it didn't teach me open-mindedness and it didn't teach me how to interact with people simply because we did we traveled so much that we never really got settled into um activities with other kids very much yeah yeah, yeah. i am the second oldest of 10 kids so there were a past of us at home 10 kids but, that's a lot of kids yeah, that's a lot of kids something about homeschoolers um, they always have huge families Right, but uh, you know, we we were raised pretty, uh, pretty religiously and pretty closed minded, closed minded in some ways. And so, one of the things that jujitsu taught me was that, you know, I might train with three different people, and they would show me three different versions of the armbar, and they were all right. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't a set, you know, this guy, what this guy's showing is right, and what this guy's showing is wrong. But it was just different ways of. of looking at the same thing you know, there's more more than one way to peel an apple and uh, and it also showed me that kind of opened my eyes to that broad spectrum approach to life and also the people that I were training with were were different you know I trained with people who were held different philosophies held different you know religious mindsets different political mindsets different genders and it kind of opened my eyes to all that because again being raised in a a more close-minded ideology it just helped me see that these people weren't you know that that we had more in common than we did and different yes yeah so it showed me that we you know there weren't as many differences between us as, as, as i thought there were and that was honestly, even to this day, that's one of the biggest lessons that jiu-jitsu has taught me. And you see a recurrence of that in the whole argument between sport jiu-jitsu and self-defense jiu-jitsu and this and this. And at the end of the day, it's, it's all jiu-jitsu. Um, and, and there are important differences. I'm not, I'm not trying to discount that. Um, and I, I have my two cents as well about the whole thing. But at the end of the day, you've got more in common than you do not in common. Yep, I totally agree. Um... You know, at the end of the day, we're all just people who like to wrestle. And um, you hear that all the time at, at uh, tournaments, or rather, I, I think about it all the time at tournaments. You know, like you get there on the mats and you're like, oh, I'm going to kill everyone. But then you think about it and you're like, eh, all these people just really like jujitsu. Yeah. You know, it, may, it takes a lot of the pressure out of, out of a tournament when you start thinking like that. And it takes a lot of pressure just out of daily training. And suddenly, you know, when when you have the confidence to know that that you can have a 300 pound guy sitting on top of you literally and and everything's going to be okay you know you can escape and you can face that giant metaphorically and literally then suddenly the guy who who cuts you off in traffic or or who you know who pisses you off in the coffee line doesn't matter quite so much Mm -hmm. because you take the confidence that you have 
on the mat and you carry it with you off the mat. And that's actually what, what kept me going back. I've told the story before on different podcasts about how uh, when I first trained jiu-jitsu, I hated it. I, I was 15 and I'd watched you know Bruce Lee and, and uh, Jet Li and Jackie Chan and these guys and I wanted to learn Kung Fu. Yeah. And so my brother and sister and I went up to take our free intro lesson with uh, with Jason Hawkins who was the Hoist Gracie black belt or brown belt at the time and so we learned trap and roll escape and the basic positions and you know a choke defense and I thought it was cool but it wasn't what I'd seen in the movies you know and so I didn't want to sign up for that but my dad talked us into taking a couple classes and I tried my first class tried the second class and eventually I started liking it a little more a little more until I just fell in love with it and then I started by training two nights a week and that morphed into three nights a week and four nights a week and five nights a week. And so I was training, you know, by the time I was 16, I was 16, 17 years old, I was training five to six days a week mm-hmm. <laughs> and we lived, we lived almost an hour away. So we would drive. Oh, an hour wow. That's awesome. Train, train for classes and drive an hour back. Um, and so let's see, where were we going with this? I think just like, uh, I don't know. Jiu-jitsu. <laughs> I just had a complete blank mind. <laughs> um, oh, oh, you, oh, the confidence. Confidence. So, <laughs> oh, the irony. So, uh, <laughs> so it was training like this, and and I remember when I would when I would first get to class, and I would start to break that sweat. We'd be drilling or running through techniques, and I would break that sweat, and you know, getting uncomfortable for the first time of the night. It would always run through my mind, man, is this really what you want to do for the rest of your life? <laughs> but it was when I would leave class, the confidence that I carried with me, knowing that I had done what I had done and knowing that I was 17 years old and I had, you know, like a 40 year old guy asking me how to do a technique. It just, that confidence that I had in my abilities and my training and my teachers felt so good. It just, it was addictive. I wanted to come back and get more. And that's mm-hmm. what let me know that I didn't mind getting uncomfortable to get there and that I wanted to keep doing that. Yeah. For me, it's the same. I really didn't like, I don't know. I didn't love judo when I started. And, um, in fact, like I mentioned to you before we started the podcast, I quit judo for like three years. And I think all the time, I think like, man, if I hadn't quit, I'd be world, <laughs> world champion, but, uh, whatever. But uh, water near a bridge. But um, the um, yeah, so I didn't like it very much, you know. And but then when I got back into it, I I really got back into it, and the confidence is huge. And for me, it gave me all of my confidence. Before I started, I had almost no confidence in myself, and now I have probably more than I should. Um, and uh, my confidence gets slow, gets drained every class, though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with each heel hook, my confidence plummets to the ground. <laughs> and there's balance in the universe again. Yes, exactly. And we're back to square one. But uh, for me, one of the things with it is just how hard it is. Like everything else I do that is not related to jujitsu feels very easy in a lot of, mm-hmm. like, you know, whether it be work or you know, maybe trying to like find my way through a new city. I don't know. Just most things in life just seem easy in comparison because it's so hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever done by, by far. And wow. See, it's, it's kind of the other way around for me. Really? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, maybe I'm just a simpleton, but it's life is hard for me to understand sometimes, but <laughs> jujitsu is the lens through which I view life and through mm. which I understand life. Because there's there's so much that applies in the way that you train that you can take and you know again like we we're talking about take it into everyday life and then for me that everyday life gains more clarity you know just just like just like cause and effect it was why you know in jujitsu or in, you know you'd, you'd always hear to eat healthy and this and that but then when you apply it to jujitsu you you understand why well because when I eat meat and eggs it makes me feel heavy and sluggish so. Mm-hmm. I won't eat meat and eggs, you know, and so that's that's why I became a vegetarian. Not because I, uh, not because, well, not only because of something I read or article I read or something like that, but because I could tell on the mat how it affected me. And 
Uh, and so jujitsu kind of adds clarity to, to everyday decisions because it's, it's a microcosm of the macrocosm. Hmm. You know, everything, that ex- everything that exists in life or in the universe for me exists on the mats. And I understand it better on the mats so then I can take that and apply it in other situations that I don't understand. That makes a lot of sense. That's a really cool perspective, I think. Like, uh, you know, it's almost like, like we were talking about before, homeschooling, it's kind of hard to uh, figure out how the world works, you know? So maybe mm-hmm. maybe you figured it out through jujitsu. Well, I wouldn't say I figured it out, but I'm, <laughs> I was, I'm, a, I'm a step closer than I was. Yeah. Yeah, me too, man. Me too. It's the same. Um, and that's that's what that's what jujitsu is in in a deeper sense. It's it's an incredible vehicle of self development, and and that's one of my favorite phrases and in my one of the more apt descriptions of jujitsu that I could render is just as a vehicle of self development. Yeah, Joe and, Rogan. Joe Rogan says that all the time. Oh, does he? See, I, I've actually never listened to the Joe Rogan podcast. Oh, you would love it. You got to listen. Oh, really? Yeah, it's the best. I'll give it a try. Yeah, you but, should. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's a vehicle. And this is another incredibly important lesson that jiu-jitsu taught me is that not everyone uses the same vehicle. For me, it's jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu gives me clarity, helps me understand things. For other people, it may be, you know, it may be another form of art. It may be a sport that I have absolutely no interest in. It may be religion. It may be, a, you know, charity work or, or whatever. But, but something helps other people develop the way jiu-jitsu helps me develop. And in, in that past kind of closed mindedness that we talked about both having with our, you know, our homeschool upbringing, then it would be easy for me to say, well, my vehicle, you know, whatever for, for me, it was religion, you know, or my particular religion, you know, but, but my vehicle is the vehicle that everyone should use because it's the right vehicle. Right. And, and jujitsu has given me the perspective to say, well, this is my vehicle and this is what helps me. But if something else helps you, then go for it. You know, as long as, as long as it's, it's loving and compassionate you're not harming another being right but and and even again going back to jiu-jitsu being a microcosm of the macrocosm if you look at it just within the scope of martial arts you know say i've got you know i've got a student that comes in and really wants to do karate and most people come in and they say karate because they don't know any differently and you know when i show them jiu-jitsu they're all about it but if someone comes in and they just they've seen karate you know and they really want to do karate I'll explain jujitsu and explain the benefits and maybe do a jujitsu intro. But if they just really want to do karate, then I'll show them where the karate school is. Yeah. And and that's because maybe they are just completely the way they're they are psychologically and nervously hardwired, they may be unable to be on the ground with their people and it just doesn't work for them and they couldn't learn that way. But the benefits that jujitsu has for them, you know, something else may or, or I'm sorry, the benefits jujitsu has for me may be held in something else for them it may be karate it may be something else and even if it's not as you know as effective for self-defense or as effective you know period it's still something that they can improve the quality of their life in and i'll be honest i'm you know i may be a little chauvinistic because i have chosen jiu-jitsu and i do believe jiu-jitsu um but jiu-jitsu also gave me the perspective to realize that jiu-jitsu isn't for everyone and the same way that it helps me understand in a martial arts standpoint that, that every martial art has something to offer. It also helped me understand that in life, not everyone's vehicle is the same. Yeah. And um, I think about this a lot as well, is that they are, although they're not the same vehicle, they have the same characteristics. Or at least to do well in any of them, I think you have to have equal dedication. You know what I mean? So, like, for example, if that guy who you talked about who wanted to do karate, if he went to a karate school, he would have to apply the same discipline to get really good at karate that we do with jujitsu. You know, so, like, he's learning the same lessons at the end of the day. It's just a totally different way of getting there. Or if he decided he wanted to be a guitar expert, you know, and he was going to write guitar music forever. He would have to apply the same lessons and the same dedication to learning the guitar that we do with jujitsu. And I think it's incredible how similar a lot of things are. And I think you're totally on the right track by saying that it's all just different vehicles to get to the same destination and learn the same lessons. I agree, Paul. That's, that's, a, that's a great extension on that mindset. Yeah, like everything is essentially the same. 
Um, do you know who Tim Ferriss is by any chance? I do. Yeah, I don't know a lot about him, but I know of him. Yeah, Tim writes about this stuff all the time and talks about it on, on his podcast. And essentially, his hypothesis is that all things are the same. Like, you to learn anything, it's the same. You know, people think like, oh, if I want to be a really good, you know, martial artist in judo, but I also want to learn how to be a really high-level swimmer, or a really good cook, like it'll take a lifetime in each thing to become a master. And his hypothesis, Absolutely. huh? Absolutely. Yeah, and um, his hypothesis is that the same, uh, the same like techniques that you use to learn to become a judo master are the same techniques that you would use to become a master cook or a swimmer or whatever. And if you look at it through that lens, it's all the same. You know, like the same, uh, for example, if you talk to Hoist Gracie and you ask him, like, what makes a really good jiu-jitsu practitioner? What do people need to do to become really high level at jiu-jitsu? He's going to probably outline, you know, what he thinks. And then if you took exactly what he said and applied it to anything else, you should become really high level in that thing. For the most part, obviously, there's going to be some key distinctions, but for the most part, you get like a blueprint to become really good at anything. Sure, which is where you get books like, you know, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the underlying, and this is a big thing in jiu-jitsu as well, the underlying principles are the same. Whether whether you're talking about the, you know, the principles to success from from one vocation to another vocation or if you're talking about the the techniques in jiu-jitsu and how each technique is different, but the underlying principles of, of body movement and body mechanics are the same. So again, it's a microcosm of the macrocosm. It's really cool to think about it like that and to think about all these things through principles because I feel like that's how you become very proficient is starting to think in principles. And I'm starting to try to do that more and more and more, but I'm still a, still a white belt when it comes to principle identification and things like that <laughs> absolutely and that that takes a you know that takes a career to to hone that ability i think i think a future guest you might really enjoy having on a podcast is my instructor and that's um that's jared jessup jared is one of hoist gracie's black belts hmm. and i think you guys would really get along and yeah have i'd love an to enlightening conversation on that on that topic yeah i'd love to what types of jared. principles does he does he think does he teach I'm sorry? What type of principles does he teach? Um, well, just kind of along the, along the lines of what we're talking about, Jared has a, has a major in philosophy and, uh, um, I'm sorry, psychology, and he's a very psychologically inclined guy and, and just has a very mature lens through which he sees jiu-jitsu. And I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys have your own conversation, but I think it would definitely be one you would enjoy. Yeah, man, thanks. I definitely will hit him up. Um... What so you've trained a lot with Hoist then, right? I have. What what are some like your big takeaways that you got from training with Hoist? Hoist keeps it simple. I know I know that he knows infinitely more than he shows. Hmm. And you know, and he keeps it very basic and very simple. And so that's a that's an important lesson for a teacher when you're when you're teaching, sometimes the hardest thing to do is, is a, you know, say there are five details about a technique, and if you see some students messing it up and not doing it correctly, you can go over and correct the the primary mistake that you see that they're making, but still walk away and watch them make three mistakes. And you've got to be able to do that because if you try to sh teach someone everything you know about the move, then, they, you know, you overload them with the information and they won't be able to do it at all. Hmm. So, you know, Hoyce, uh, one of the things that I've taken away from watching him in all the seminars that he's taught is he, you know, he shows very basic techniques and he shows it in a very basic way so that people grasp the essence of what they need to learn to do the move. And then over time or, you know, into each individual person, he goes around and he adds another layer of detail. Um, you know, so you, you do this or this is why the hand goes here or something like that. But the initial application is, is always simple, clear, and concise. And that's a, 
that's a great methodology for a teacher to have, in my opinion, because there are, there are so many people in the jiu-jitsu community that are fantastic athletes, but that are poor teachers. And just because you're, uh, you know, you're a beast on the mats does not mean you can show that to someone else. And so one of the, you know, again, one of the takeaways from Hoyce is that he doesn't try to show you everything he knows. And I mean, he's, he's Hoyce Gracie, you know, he knows so much about each technique, but when you hear him teach and when you, when you're taught by him, he doesn't try to show you everything he knows. He shows you what you need to know. Hmm. And then once you grasp that, then he, he builds on that. So I tried to model my, uh, that aspect of my teaching presentation off of what I've learned from him. That's very, uh, it's very observational of you to like pick that up that he, that he does that. That's, that's really cool. Well, to, to take it to the next level, you've got to, hone your ability to observe those things it's you know that's the zanshin aspect of the 753 code you've got to you've got to expand your awareness and there's so much depth in in everything in life that you can easily just cruise by without noticing and uh and when you when you hone your ability to uh, to well to expand your awareness then there's so much depth that opens up it's just like in jiu-jitsu you could, you know, you could cruise through Americana or armbar or basic technique you've done since white belt and do it the white belt way, or you can choose to put in the work and slow it down and look at it in a deep level, and that's where you take the same technique from white belt level to purple belt level to black belt level. And uh, also, I think it's very important to like be able to pick up when you're watching. Your, your instructor or some really high level guy at a seminar pick up like what are they doing that they're not even explaining like what are they doing that maybe they maybe they're aware that they're doing it but maybe not or maybe they're just not going to explain on it because it's such a detail that but you know what are, what are they doing that they're not even talking about doing you know absolutely sometimes sometimes you can learn more by what's not being said than by what is being said and that's a great pickup Paul it's not mine. It's, a, it's, it's Tim Ferriss's again. All, all credit to my lord and master, Tim Ferriss. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he talked about that in one of his books, and um, I think about it a lot, especially with my teacher Renee at Matrix. He he does a lot of things that he does not talk about, like uh, his speed is one of those things. You know, like uh, or I was recently at a seminar with Michael Liera Jr. And my biggest takeaway from him was his pressure. And he didn't even talk about his pressure the entire... The seminar was on, like, passing De La Hiba guard. And uh, he didn't even talk about his pressure. But I was his uh, demonstrator for one of the one of his techniques. And uh, his pressure was just absolutely unbelievable. Like, I couldn't even move, you know? And, um, oh, wow. like, it was a very simple X guard pass. And then he got knee on belly... And then, you know, like they turn away from you in neon belly and then you take the back. Very simple, basic drill. And uh, so he got me in neon belly and then he was like, okay, now roll away from me and I'll take your back. And I couldn't roll. I couldn't move. And his, this was just a demonstration. Like we weren't, we weren't even sparring. And um, I was, it was like, it was like moving through, through mud or something. Cause his pressure was just, wow. his knee was just pinning me to the mat. There was nothing I could do. And, um, yeah, so stuff like that is, I think, very important. And, you know, if you're a white belt, it's not so important because you just need to worry about, like, learning your basic moves. But I think it's very important when you get to be higher level. Absolutely. And and what, what you're touching on there is learning to feed yourself because your teacher won't always be there telling you, each thing you need to pay attention to and each thing you need to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, Paul, do the armbar this way. Hey, Paul, squeeze your knees on the armbar. Hey, Paul, make sure the thumb's pointed up. And he's, you know, the, the, the teacher's job, a good instructor doesn't just tell the student what to do. A good instructor cultivates the student's ability to learn for themselves. Mm. And you've got to be able over time to grow into your own t instructing. When, when people ask me what my job is, I always tell them I'm a professional student because 
if all you're doing is if all you're capable of doing is listening to someone else tell you what to do, well, that's that's not a that lack of creativity and lack of inner drive is not going to take you very far in jiu-jitsu. And it's because there's going to be a point where someone's not there to tell you, or where you're in a situation where no one has explained to you how to get out. And as you learn how to teach yourself, you learn how to ask yourself the right questions, and that's hugely important to ask yourself, you know, which direction can I still move? Where um, what's not being said in this explanation, so on and so forth, and all the other things that we've been talking about. But learning how to teach yourself is stepping beyond just the the student teacher relationship to where you can look at a situation or, or be in the middle of a role or uh, you know be seeing what's happening or what's going on and and extract something from it that's not even being taught or that that maybe you've never thought of before and looking at a situation in a different light and that's how you take your your journey from you know from being spoon fed each technique to where you really start understanding the underlying principles and concepts of the art that's a it's a really great explanation i did i did ninjutsu for a period of time and oh, did you? yeah i did um i eventually gave, gave it up because i uh you know i questioned the uh effectiveness of the invisible art of the ninja assassin um but it was cool i learned how to bow staff fight and be a sword fighter and stuff like that a little bit, but I decided like, hey, I think I'm going to focus on jujitsu. But um, I had a really, really good teacher. It was this guy named Leonard, and he, if Leonard taught jujitsu, he would be like world class instructor. Mm. Like we would all know his name. But he chose ninjutsu, and that was that was his vehicle. And um, something that he told us all the time. I still think about his like lessons that he taught all the time. And one thing he said was that we are responsible for our own training. And he said he said that all the time. He would say, like, you are responsible for your own training. And he would use all sorts of examples to explain this. And it's something that's really stuck with me. And he said, you know, basically exactly what you said. Like, we can't rely only on him. We can't rely only on the instructor to pick out, you know, what we need to do. And... um yeah, and make, he, he was like, you can't rely on the instructor to, like, make you come to class and, you know, all this stuff. And he also said, like, um, people think when they come to study martial arts that they're going to learn discipline because you always hear, like, oh, discipline is what you learn when you learn a martial art. Discipline, discipline. And he was like, yeah. we're never doing, like, discipline drills. You know, like, I'm never, like he was saying we never like sit in meditation for like 30 minutes to like practice our discipline. Yeah. He was like the discipline that you learn is from learning how to be a better student, you know, and coming to class and paying attention and practicing when you're not here and studying online and reading books. And like, that's the discipline. The discipline is like taking uh, ownership of your own training. And, exactly right. Yeah, and I think about that all the time, and it's really stuck with me. Even though my bow staff fighting has not stuck with me, the lessons he <laughs> <laughs> the lessons he taught definitely stuck, and I think about them all the time. Well, it sounds like you extracted what you needed from that relationship. I did. Um, he's a great guy. We still keep in touch, but uh, um, yeah, he taught he taught a lot of ninja wisdom. Well, that's that's spot on, you know, and I I totally agree with that. It's it's high time people accepted responsibility for themselves. And um, I tell that all the time to, like, people who are just coming up, like, maybe white belts or people, I don't know, people who ask my opinion about it. They, you know, I tell them that, like, you are the one who's responsible. And I, I see it all the time. One way that I see it is uh, when it's time to pair up for partners. A lot of time, you know, when you're going to practice a technique or something like that, a lot of the time you, um, well, not you, but, like, a person could choose to pair up with someone who's weaker than themselves. Like maybe they're like, oh, I'll teach the new white belt something, you know, and they're, they're a purple belt. And they're yeah. like, yeah, I'm going to teach the new white belt something. You know, maybe we're practicing takedowns or something. He's like, I'll show the new white belt how to do a takedown. And that's cool, of course. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. But like sometimes I think like, no, I really need to like pair up with someone better than me. Because I need to push myself because yeah. I'm responsible for my own training and it's the coach's job to make sure that the new white belt has someone to partner with 
Meanwhile, I need to work on my takedowns. So I'm going to partner up with this dude who I know is going to destroy me. So that way he can, you know, we can work together. So I don't know. I think about it all the time. And uh, uh, I think that jujitsu does have a lot to learn from traditional martial arts in the philo- philosophy department. Truth is truth. And it really doesn't matter what, you know, where it comes from. Truth is truth. And, uh, and, and, Traditional martial arts has, like you're saying, it has a lot of that truth, you know, in the lessons, and jujitsu does as well. But you have to be able to extract it, which goes back to learning how to ask yourself the right questions and looking deeper into the situation. And that that uh, that motivation you're talking about to be better—that's one of the reasons that I love competing so much. Mm-hmm. And for me, the the competition is what drives me to be better. Of course, I want to be the best instructor that I can be, and I, it's fulfilling to teach and to see students develop, and even the students that will never compete. Um, it's, it's still fulfilling to see them better themselves and, and reach their potential. But for me, as an athlete, I I love competing. You know, it, it, it fuels me and it drives me because I have something to work toward, and I know that every day that I'm sleeping in you know my my opponents are getting up early and drilling and training and it pushes me to be better to train every day and i on top of of teaching full-time i try to get at least two hours a day of rolling and drilling in every day and then conditioning on top of that and so you know that's not always hard to keep up with but it's knowing that you know i've got this competition coming up in three weeks or this this you know super fighter or something like that just makes me want to put in everything I can and to to not let a day go by where I didn't train harder than the day before I didn't train as hard you know and so the competitiveness I guess I'm a competitive person by nature and I'm most competitive with myself and Mm -hmm. wanting to to be you know better than than the clay that was here yesterday and so the the part of the that's one part of the art that resonates well with me and as far as the, the sport versus self-defense, you know, the endless sport versus self-defense argument, mm-hmm. um, I feel I feel that self-defense should always be first. And the, the art was designed to teach a smaller person how to defend themselves against a bigger person. And I think we do ourselves an injustice when we, we don't address that. So many students come in that want to learn self-defense and so few come in that want to compete just off, off the, you know, the, the – the, the initial introductory lessons, you know, most people want to learn how to defend themselves and yeah. how to be more confident. Yeah, for sure. And not many people, not many people want to come in and be professional athletes. Mm-hmm. Having said that, the co- competition has so many benefits for people. So I, I don't want to force it on anyone either way. I would, I would never want to tell someone they should never compete or tell someone that they, they have to compete. But I want both to be open to anyone. But I, I, I do think the self-defense should always be first. I think people should learn you know the, the the basics of, of defending themselves and just continue to cultivate that throughout their entire jiu-jitsu career and also that you have to be aware of the strikes and you have to train each area of jiu-jitsu you have to train the standing self-defense you know, what do you do if someone pulls a gun on you or pins you up against the wall or grabs you in a headlock what do you do if you know the clinch work in the throws or the the striking, how do you throw a gut, you know, a cross or a hook or a knee or an elbow? You don't have to send someone to Muay Thai class if you're teaching the entire art of Jiu Jitsu the way Alio Gracie taught it. And at the same time, you've got to understand the grappling and the groundwork, not just De La Hiva guard, but also how to block punches and how to escape mount if someone's trying to break your face. And then the 753 code and the philosophy as well. Mm-hmm. So I. I was raised in that jiu-jitsu lineage, and I wholeheartedly believe that it's the purpose of the art and that it is the the most complete and safest way to go, you know, teaching people a foundation of punch awareness and self-defense. Yeah. But on the other hand, I also hear a lot of people in the, you know, like self-defense lineage talk badly about competing or feeling like it's it's all just athleticism and, and you know, um, you're, you're – uh, degrading the art and things like that, and I think there's some there's some truth on both sides of the fence. But mm. c- competing makes people better. You know, it doesn't just make them better athletes. It gives them something to work toward. It makes them train harder. It makes them better. And I I love competing. I think it has a rich bounty of 
um, of benefits that it brings to people. It motivates them. It you know it, it increases the communication in the jiu jitsu network and community, and it it evolves the art. You know, if you watch videos of of people training Gracie Jiu Jitsu in 1960 versus people training in you know in 2000, it's it's clear that the the art is evolving and becoming more yeah. refined. Yeah, yeah, and. Um, and so I think it's kind of silly to say that that you know we should never change the way we're doing anything because someone had it right the first time. Well, jujitsu is you know Gracie jujitsu is based on on challenging the standard and and making it better. Um, that's that's why we're not all doing judo now, you know. Yeah. So I think I think there's there's reason on both sides, and I don't think you have to either be a self defense or a competitor. I'm both, and. I want to equip my students to be both as well. I think, or if they want to be, you know, I think, I think you can drill, drill hard and train hard and be a great competitor, and also have a foundation in self defense and be punch aware and be able to throw strikes and train the entire art jiu jitsu. And I think, I think that's a mature way to look at it. Is where you don't have to dichotomize either or. It's not it doesn't have to be either or. You can do both and be good at it. Yeah, I started off kind of at a self-defense jiu-jitsu school. I started training at Helsing Gracie Jiu-Jitsu in uh, Maryland. So Helsing Gracie affiliate, very, very strong self-defense emphasis. And those guys are awesome. And they go to competitions and they do very well. And yeah, great. Very good guys. Um, but my, my opinion has shifted so much coming here to Europe and training in Poland and now training at Matrix and what I've realized, because uh, those guys, they 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 focus on self defense to an extent, but they mostly are focused on competition. But their jujitsu is like I don't think that the self defense guys, if if they came to the practice, they would have no problems with what was being taught. Like from what I've experienced, especially the guys in Poland, like all they all they do is compete at IBJJF. That's it. They don't even. They don't really like competing at Abu Dhabi or, you know, no gi events. It's all gi, IBJJF, which in uh, the self-defense world, that's seen as like, oh, man, you're polluting the art. You know yeah. what I mean? But the thing is, is just from what I experienced, like what they're teaching is, you know, get the takedown, pass the guard, get on top, get a choke or an armbar, you know, like. 90% of the time, that's what will win you the tournament. You know, that, sure. that's what they're teaching. Like, yeah, there's a few guys there at their club who are, like, really into Barambolo or something like that. But the way that a lot of self-defense guys make it sound is they make it sound like everyone is just teaching Barambolo and De La yeah. Hiva back takes and crazy, you know, like, no, for the most part, they're just saying, like, if you go to 99% of jiu-jitsu schools and ask them, like, hey, what's a good... What's a good way to win a tournament? They're going to say, take them down, pass the guard, get to mount, choke them out. You know, like, it's a, that's it. And yeah, there might be some fancy moves thrown in there every once in a while. But for the most part, everyone, everyone's kind of on the same page. They just, they just argue about, about it too much. And I, I think the important thing, the important distinction, because there is a difference and there's a difference for a reason. Yeah, for sure. You, the important distinction is the distance management because there is a difference whether you're trying to grab grips and take someone down and, and whether you understand how to clinch and do a, you know, do a safe takedown. Yeah, that's where, a very good point. You know, where you're, you're not only aware of the strikes, but you're also aware you don't want to bust your knees on the concrete, you know, and, and so there are some important distinctions and I, I, you know, I understand that. However, you know, the pendulum can easily swing too far one way or the other. You can have a school, and I've seen this, you know, time and time again, schools that identify so much with being a self-defense school that that they can't roll very well, you know? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Like, you can't roll because you identify so strongly with being one thing that you, you're just ignorant of so much of the art. And I came up to, you know, to about a purple belt without having a clue how to pass De La Hiva guard or really how to play spider guard or anything like that. Not that those are the most important fundamentals for a white belt to learn, but I want to know every part of the art. Yeah, know? for sure. I, I want to know how to Barambolo, not because I, not because that's going to be my kind of game, 
But because I'm an instructor, and if a student asks me, there, I don't want there to be a part of the game that I'm ignorant of, you know? If, if yeah, only sure. to know how to stop it, you know? I want to understand the different ins and outs of the guards and, the, you know, and the, uh, how to use the lapels and the grips. Not because it's, it's, not because it's the most fundamental or the most practical, but just because I want to understand the entire art. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's one extreme is a self-defense school that, that you know, doesn't – that the students are ignorant of important parts of the game or that just can't roll very well because they're so focused on that. And the other side of it is a school that's so competition-based that they drive away so many people because they only cater to the athletes, you know, and they basically weed out the weak. And, you know, that's – I don't think that's what Alio intended either. <laughs> you know, Alio – yeah. Design jujitsu as as a vehicle to empower the weak, not to not to drive them away. So, uh, so I think you know, as as always in life, the the truth is in the balance between the extremes, and you've got to be able to, to take those two extremes and find the truth in the middle, and that's that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and so you know, I train you know where, where I train with Jared at IQ, we you know I think we do a pretty good job of finding that balance. And our focus at IQ is is obviously more on the self defense aspect. And I've been training at a, another school, a buddy of mine um, with Andrew. His name's Andrew Wilson. He's a three time world champion, and he trains at a school called Pedago Submission Fighting. That's uh, about a half hour away from us. Hmm. And they had they just have a very small elite school under Rodrigo Vaghi, which is distantly under the Hicks and Gracie lineage. And they you know they just have a fighters den. It's just a group of uh, a small group of guys that are just absolute beasts and they just drill and train for hours every day and you know and they they're white belts and blue belts and purple belts all win the worlds and pan ams it's just it's a small school with with you know Killers. world champion after, world champion after world champion it's it's kind of like autos um, yeah. but but probably you know uh so it's it's just a a, a very very competitive school but i've learned so much by going up and you know i train with them about once a week and i've learned a lot about the ins and outs of the sport game and I, you know and my my jujitsu game as a whole has gotten better with that exposure yeah so i'm i'm a huge fan of cross training with as many different schools and people as you can because it's it just helps you see those different perspectives and fill in the holes in your game i couldn't agree more i think uh, i think it's all I mean, I, I see that there's a distinction between, like, sport and self-defense and all that, but I just think it's a little silly sometimes. Like, my coach, Renee, um, like I said, Matrix is a very sport-oriented school for the most part, but he doesn't like a lot of fancy stuff. Like, he doesn't like De La Hiva Guard or Spider Guard. He says he tells us not to do them because he thinks that they're not that effective because they're too, they're too complicated. He says, like, the, the simple stuff is better in his opinion so and i agree i would say like and his guys are winning tournaments everywhere so like i don't know i think that if you're really good at the fundamental gracie style jujitsu maybe with some fancier stuff thrown in like you're you're gonna win tournaments everywhere like you don't need to focus on de la hiva and all this other stuff but it's really good to know like you were saying and it's awesome. It's really cool that you have that perspective. Yeah, and I've, I've, I've gotten that from. Well, I appreciate that, Paul. Thank you. I, I've gotten that from watching my own jujitsu journey. You know, over the last eight years. Yesterday, I sat down and watched uh, some competition videos of myself from three or four years ago, and I was just cringing through the whole thing. <laughs> you know, like, oh my gosh, I, I had no concept of how to pass that guard, or I had no idea what to do in that position, and I was just. I was just ignorant of, of those areas of the game and, yeah. and going deeper into them and cross training has, has helped me expand my horizons. So now I feel pretty comfortable in, in, you know, in almost any variation or position. And there are still some that I need to explore right now. I'm, I'm exploring leg locks. I explored back mount for about three years and I explored triangles for a couple of years. And so those are two of my strong points in addition to the, the judo and standing up. Uh, so the triangles and back mount are some studies that I did. I, gone through and continue to study but right now i'm i'm exploring leg locks a bit and getting into spider guard just a little bit but there are just things that i'm not familiar with or have never been familiar with that I'm, i want to be better at i once trained with a black belt in idaho and he said something that's always stuck with me he said i don't want to be a black belt with a black belt triangle but a white belt footlock hmm. you know i want to have a black belt footlock i want to have a black belt Toriana pass. I want to have a black belt half guard bottom. I want to have a black belt Kimura. And so 
if you were, you know, if you're a, a purple belt, and I was, I think I just got my purple belt at the time. He said, if you're a purple belt and you have a purple belt Kimura, but a, a, a blue belt footlock, then, you know, put your Kimura on hold for a little bit and get your footlock up to the same level and then go back and do that for every technique until you feel like you are a purple belt in every area of Jiu Jitsu. And I've, uh, that stuck with me and I've really started to try to apply that now, especially as a brown belt. And I think that's a, a healthy mindset to have to, to work on your weakness, to accept your strength, to work on your weaknesses as well. That's a really good, it's a really good quote. I like that. That's really cool. I'll be thinking about that. And I think that's a good place to, to leave off, to leave with that quote. And um, I've got to head out. Thanks so much for being on the show, man. My pleasure, Paul. I really enjoyed it. This has been great. Is there anything that you want to promote before we head off? Man, um, I just wanted to say thank you to some people that have, that have helped me be here. It's I really enjoy having the opportunity to talk to you and, and being maybe being a voice for some of these ideas that you and I have discussed. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't be here without certain key people. So I want to say thank you, as always, to you know to Hoist Gracie and Huron and Henry Gracie and, and those guys that I've gotten to train with quite a bit. And then to, to my instructor, Jared Jessup, and everything you know that, that he and I have, have done and been through together and all the wisdom that he's given me. And then to uh, you know to Jason Hawkins and Eli Knight and Derek Perry who were my first martial arts instructors, and to uh, to Natalie Brelsford who's, who's my girlfriend and constant training partner, and uh, and then just to to all of the guys that I get to drill with every week with Clint Metzger and Ben Ferguson and Chris Farron and Andrew Wilson and all those guys, and just uh, just all my students and training partners. You know, we none of us are here by ourselves. And Paul, thanks to you for for the opportunity and the interview. Thanks, man. Anytime. I'll have to. We'll have to do this again. And next time I'm in the U.S., maybe I'll try to come visit. Definitely, man. You've always got a place to stay. You know, anyone, anyone in the jiu-jitsu community, you've got a place to stay with me and a place to train. And next time I'm in Europe, if you're still over there, then let's get together. For sure, man. Like, uh, we'll we'll have to do some sort of seminar of some sort at Matrix or something, and we'll Renee will be able to help you with the leg locks you were talking about. Perfect. <laughs> I mean, Perfect. Sounds like a plan. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks again to Clay for being on the show. Please go to trekjitsu.com and check out our show notes for all the details and links to everything that we talked about on this episode. And once again, please go check out Matrix on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash C slash Matrix Show Your Role. And you can find that link everywhere where Trek Jitsu is posted. And check us out. We are a jujitsu video streaming service that offers you free footage of jujitsu sparring, technique videos, tournament footage, highlight videos, and all sorts of other stuff. We're looking for viewer submitted content. So if you want a place to like showcase some of your skills, please send in a video to matrixvideo at gmail.com. We will promote your footage. We'll uh, give it a place to live on the internet and uh, we're trying to create kind of like an art gallery for jujitsu in a way. We figure that like normal art has galleries all over the world where people can view art from, you know, whether it be modern art or sculpture or whatever type of art, you know, you're interested in looking at. So we figure it's time that martial arts kind of have a similar place, at least in the virtual world of the Internet. If you enjoy Trek Jitsu, please go to iTunes and give us a five-star rating and a review. This is a really great way to help promote the show. And, you know, if you enjoy what we're doing, I'd really appreciate it. Also, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And I hope that you enjoy your, your day, your week, your month, and ultimately your life. And thanks for listening.